Wow. Amazing. Another episode of Life with the Author, and I'm happy, and maybe some of you might know these faces. We already had a discussion with the, with the three musketeers, Panos Batos, Javier Tapia, and Sasha Hein, my, my dear friends of the Bioemulation Group, and I'm really happy to talk about dental photography tonight. So uh, this was the teaser we have sent out to everybody. First, there was only Panos on, on this, but then uh, spontaneously we added also Sasha and Javier because they, are, they belong to the group. And so I think it's important to have all on, in the boat uh, and start the discussion about dental photography. We, we had this special issue on dental photography with quintessence in German at the end of 2019. And um, a few weeks ago, I received this French translation and we were wondering why Sasha is bigger on the French cover than on the German cover. We will see who's the biggest on the English cover. I know that the Turkish version is coming out. So I think this is a hot topic. And uh, that's why Quintessence is translating this into different languages. But I can promise you, we are working on the special issue for the International Journal of Aesthetic Dentistry, and this will be something amazing. We already have the, the editorial sent, uh, written and already sent to me and already edited by Pascal Manie, and he's, he's eager and asking me every other day, where are we with this special issue? And uh, I, I can tell you, I can tell Pascal if he's listening to us, uh, we are working hard on this issue and I'm looking forward to get something special out next year. So hello and welcome uh, to, to, my, to my buddies. And maybe we will start because so far everybody everybody's just saying hello in different languages from different countries. Uh, look, oh, okay, we like that. A lot of talent. Maybe the force is strong in us, Panos. Kalispera po Elava. Hello to everyone. Good evening from Greece. Good morning to all the parts of the world. Evening, afternoon, whatever is going on. I'm so happy to share the stage with my brothers, my brothers from other mothers, uh, all three of them actually, you know, Sastra, Javi, and Alessandro. Alessandro would be my older brother. So if I ever am in financial crisis, that is the man that I'm going to. You know, right? I have the Swiss bank account. Yes, you are. <laughs> okay. So, dental photography, right? Dental photography. So maybe, oh. maybe, maybe we we can start because I invited the four of you uh, today. Today you teased some new things. So so basically, maybe we do a small teasing as an introduction, and I don't know, Sasha, do you want to take over the word to give us some, uh, you're wearing the ELAP, the ELAP shirt and living on the Death Star. So um, maybe you give us some uh, short teasers on what's going on with ELAP. Yeah, the Death Star is the ultimate tax haven, even more so than Switzerland. Like there's no taxes on the Death Star, right? Um, so first of all, Alessandro, thank you very much again for putting this together and, and for your continuous effort into promoting um, dental photography for the purpose of improving communication within the field of dentistry and I guess in the special context of restorative dentistry. And this is where our interest lies, um, Javier Panos, and my interest and yours as well is especially to improve the uh, communication between the dental lab and the dental office and so, you know, we set out many years ago um, to make trade communication between both fields more objective and, you know, perhaps even to invent a new language to communicate shades over the distance using quantification. And so we've come, up, we've come a long way uh, since we first implemented the uh, EI protocol, you know, at the time, you know, with, with uh, third party software like Lightroom and Photoshop and that, and then, you know, gradually it evolved from there. We had our own standalone developments and our own standalone software. And so one of the things that we're constantly exchanging about and discussing about, and, you know, you would know, Alessandro, because you're, you know, you're part of this as well. We often have joint discussions about progress, about innovations, um, you know, thinking out of the box and finding new ideas and new approaches to solving 
you know, industry persistent problems. And I guess trade communication has always been an industry persistent problem until this very day. And so since the, since the introduction of the launch of the eLab system and its gradual evolution, uh, we've always looked into how can we make this better? How can we make it easier? How, we, how can we make it more precise? Um, and how can, we, how can we make it also more convenient? And when you think about these attributes, you know, when you think about convenience and you think about accuracy and things like that, you know, especially in a field that is as delicate as spectroscopy and the quantification of diffusely scattering objects, um, these, these are almost opposite to each other, right? How can something be more convenient and yet more accurate at the same time, you know? And, and I, guess we, I guess we devote ourselves to questions like this, I think precisely not because they're easy, but because they're hard. That's, that's why we devote ourselves to questions like this. And so we launched the um, eLab Prime application last year at the um, second eLab symposium in Marseille in October 2019. But, you know, our thought process has already begun much earlier where we realized that um, we all enjoy the merits and benefits of dental photography, but a lot of people in our industry struggle with um, using digital cameras. And nowadays there's so many variations. Now you have the mirrorless cameras, which I know, Alessandro, you're a great fan of mirrorless cameras and that. Um, and so you have more flexibility and with it, you have more complexity as well. And many people are sort of over challenged with this complexity. They need solutions that are accurate and, and that work. And so, you know, we've been banging our heads together and thinking about it. how can we achieve this? You know, how can we make, uh, how can we make dental photography easier? And, and especially for the purpose of shade communication. And in this regard, you know, I got to, I got to really pay huge credit to uh, Louis Hadan uh, from Lebanon, who's really paved the path of you know making smartphones you know um more accepted i guess in the field of dentistry which tends to be quite conservative for the purpose of you know uh taking photos of dental photography and and you know he's really he's really been a pioneer in that area as well so what we want to know was you know is it, is it possible to combine this approach for the purpose of shape quantification and over the course of the last i don't know 12 or 13 months we have started with the development of a standalone uh, smartphone app, uh, which we have called the eLab Mobile app, which runs on iOS devices and it runs on Android devices, pretty much on every smartphone, um, to be used in combination with um, an illumination device. The one that we sort of favor at the moment is the SmileLight MEP, or um, for instance, the one from, from uh, Photomat SLA, uh, so it should be used in, 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 in uh, or NU, for instance, from Indonesia. So there's a lot of tools and gear available today to assist with smartphone photography, and um, that's that's basically what the uh, that's what the eLab Prime, uh, sorry, the eLab uh, mobile phone app has been designed for. But it's one thing to make an app. You know, making an app is is not maybe that difficult. I mean, a lot of people have apps, right? But but you know to get this color thing consistent is is a considerable scientific challenge. So for people to be able to combine um, a target shade image out of a smartphone with you know a, a 50 megabyte RAW out of a modern Nikon mirrorless camera and expect the same color accuracy is is quite is quite challenging. So you know this has been a lot of research and I guess research is at the heart of you know, what we have been doing all along, you know, with buying relation and, and with ELEP, all these things basically, you know, belong together. And we've been always very heavy on, on research because the answers lie fundamentally in research. As frustrating as research very often is, um, if you're persistent enough and you have the right people in the team, you know, you, you get somewhere. Okay, so the, the, question, the question at this stage or at this point is also, um, color or shade communication is not dental photography. So uh, is that correct? If, if, I, if I make these two different topics, Sasha? Uh, to, me, to me, shade quantification in, 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 in our context uh, includes dental photography, but it transcends it onto a new level. You know, pure dental photography, the way that we have known it for the last, you know, 25 or 30 years has been mainly of pure descriptive nature, qualitative nature, descriptive nature. Whereas with, with the eLab protocol, we have attached a new molecule to that, if you want, uh, which includes accurate quantification. So it includes 
damn photography that transcends it to another level. That's how I would explain it. Okay, so uh, maybe Javier. So what? Uh, so I know that you're a DSLR, DSLR guy, and also Panos and myself. I'm the mirrorless photographer now. I I tried, I tried MDP. I have all these devices in in my office. For me, it was always hard to really create this standardized workflow, and um, and uh, that's why my question to Sasha was related to. The smartphone in dental photography, I'm not sure if it can now replace DSLR or mirrorless cameras, but in the context of shade communication, where you only take pictures of the front teeth, that's something different. Or we could say we, we could use the smartphone to do portrait photography if with, with good light. So um, what are your thoughts, Javier, on, 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 this, on this topic? Yeah, for me, I think it's uh, definitely mobile phone photography is, is catching up and it's getting closer and closer to uh, to what we know for, for the normal cameras, right? Uh, if you think about it, the difference between a mirrorless and, uh, and a mobile phone is basically the size of the, of the center, right? That's the, the biggest difference, uh, I will say. Uh, so indeed, of course, uh, this this is this is um, uh, really creating a, a gap, I will say, between the, the quality you can get out of, of them. But one thing is, of course, the color accuracy and how to calibrate and measure a color and how many pixels that we need for that and how many. It's probably not as much as. Uh, and if you consider actually the machines, because if you if you look at the sensors built in into the spectrophotometers and colorimeters and so on, actually the output is quite low resolution. <laughs> it's not very high. So you don't really need to have a huge sensor and a huge machine to, to have the, the, the color accuracy, I will say. So, um, but of course, for dental photography in general, I, I think that for me, the biggest gap, it's not, it's not actually about the mobile phone itself, but about the lack of capacity to fire a flash. So you cannot trigger a flash with a mobile phone. And I think that that's, that has been the main limitation of mobile phone photography because you need to use always uh, dedicated LED lights, which sometimes don't, don't provide the same kind of illumination that we can achieve with a, with a flash, with a xenon tubes, right? With a, with a classic speed lights. So uh, I think at the moment we can start using some, uh, some triggering or the, the companies, they made some triggering of flashes for, for, for mobile phones. I think things are gonna change a lot because that, that will mm, close the gap a lot on the kind of illumination. We need to understand that a small sensor, the main limitation of a small sensor is just the lack of capacity to capture light in the same way as a bigger sensor. So uh, we, can, we can think about it in the other way around, which means that if we put a lot of light, we will have a high quality picture, which is actually what happens when you take pictures in a mo with a mobile phone uh, in the in the um, uh, in a clear sky in a nice day. You have very very nice pictures today with a with a very small sensor of a mobile phone. So it's all about light. I mean, it's it's the amount of light that you put there that's gonna give you more more quality and sharpness, and the, the it, it will increase dramatically the the quality of the picture. So. I still think that the continuous light from uh, from uh, LED light is still a little bit limited on on the on on how much uh, power you can drain from from that flash and from that uh, that that's not it's never going to be on pair with the the flash you know with the speed light. Uh, however, I think that there is one field in which the the, the mobile phone is actually taking over the DSLRs and uh, and the other cameras and is when mounted on a microscope. I think that's where it becomes very, very interesting because the, the small sensor has actually an advantage. Okay, and that's where I, I think that for me now it's the 100% the recommendation. If you want to do dental photography uh, just with a, with a microscope in a simple way, the best option today is to buy the, the adapter for the, for the smartphone because you, you actually are taking the output from the microscope, which is not a big size in a normal camera set you are actually uh, increasing the size of the of the light because you need to cover a bigger area of the sensor of the camera, right? 
So it's actually a C mount converted into a bigger mount, right? So you are losing light. And actually, you, you always get like maybe 20%, maybe some beam splitters, they have 50-50. But the reality is that you're losing a lot of light. And then you are opening the light to cover a bigger area. And with the, with the phones, it's actually the opposite. So you take the C uh, mount, and then you have a bigger circle that you need to focus into a smaller area of the mobile phone sensor. And actually, that is increasing the light intensity a lot. So if you put into comparison, into perspective, you put a normal DSLR camera at ISO 100 on a microscope, you put the microscope at 100% power of the light, and it looks dark, very dark. You need to crank up the ISO to maybe 800 or something like that, so you can start looking at something. And uh, if you do the same with a mobile phone at 100, it will be already overexposed. At ISO 100, an, an iPhone is already overexposed. So it is quite interesting because that gives a lot of advantage on the on the capturing of the light, and uh, and then of course at the end it's 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 all about using the the lens of the microscope. So the lens factor you are you don't have it there, okay? It's just the microscope that is your lens, so it doesn't matter. And I think that is very practical on a daily basis. I think it's really fantastic, and also you can do very cool things like recording. 4K video very easily. You can throw your videos on your on your shots directly wirelessly to a, to a TV you have in the office. It's super nice, and also even recording slow motion. So I think it's it's where it is replacing the DSLR right now. For me, it's on the microscope, for sure. So the other question was uh, about macro lenses in mobile. So what I what I see, Javier, is uh, that for the next years, I think the smartphone will be an addition to our standard equipment we have, because I don't think that in the next five years, we will have smartphones with 105 millimeter macro lenses with an f-stop of 25, because that's not the market of the smartphone photographers. So the dentists are not the main market for a smartphone photographer. So I see the new smartphones have ultra wide angle lens, a wide angle lens, and then so kind of a portrait lens, but they are not really having a dedicated macro lens that we use with our DSLR or our DSLM camera. So what, what do you think about this? Because then we are still discussing about standardized photography and the further away I go, the less I care about the, 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 the focal length and everything. But if I get closer to the subject, I think we should, we should talk about macro lenses in, uh, in mobile photography. What do you yeah. think? Yeah, absolutely. I think that the, 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 the thing of the focal lens, of course, the focal length, the equivalent focal length, but uh, I mean, the telephoto lens on an iPhone, for example, it's like, if I remember well, it's about a 50 millimeter equivalent. So it's not really like a tele. I mean, it's just like 52 or 56. So it's it's almost just a standard lens, right? Uh, but I believe that the, in the in the I think in the Samsung uh, smartphones you have already some of them with a with a telephoto of 80 millimeter equivalent, which can be pretty good for already for for what we're talking about. The only thing that I don't know if if this telephoto can focus at close distance, which is actually what is the macro. Uh, thing. I mean, at the end, a macro lens is nothing but a, a fixed focal that can focus in a closer distance. That's it. So, uh, if if this kind of uh, of lenses uh, on the phones can focus a little bit closer like that, and with this kind of telephoto like the Samsung 80 millimeters, I think that will be very interesting to try out this this kind of, of phones because you know they have now three cameras, four cameras. So every camera, additional camera they put on they change the focal length. So actually you have like, it's incredible because at the end it's like you have four or five different fixed focals in a phone. <laughs> so it, it actually outperforms probably having a zoom lens, you know, because it is just a, a fixed camera with a fixed focal. So it's designed for that focal length and, and everything is designed and it works smoothly, right? So I think we can be surprised in the future. I think this this kind of telephoto uh, lenses that like like the Samsung definitely 
I would like to try it. I didn't have you know, the opportunity to do it, but uh, but I'm pretty sure that they will bring very nice, uh, very nice quality. But for me, still the gap is more more than the lenses. It, it is bigger in plastic. I wish we had something for that because I for up to today I haven't seen anything that can trigger a platform memorial phone. But I hope it, it's it's gonna be possible in the future. Uh, we cannot hear you, Alessandro. Ah, uh, sorry, yeah. Panos, what are what are your thoughts from being our philosopher? Uh, I think we're going through an era of technological advancement. Uh, for me, the, 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 the mobile photography is catching up now. 2020, 2019, 2020, not 2015, not 2016, not 2017, not 20, you know, it was, it's starting to get there now. And I think it's complementary. I think we're going through a transition zone right now where we do have some overlaps as Javi stated, you know, there are some advantages, particularly in microscopic photography for mobile photography. But again, if we're talking about standardization, DSLR, DSLM is going to be the king. It's going to reign supreme for the next couple of years. However, if we go back to the topic of what Sasha is trying to decode, he's trying to work with uh, mobile photography as being a, a tool, a very specific scientific tool. So I, I see complete complementary uh, synergies right now forming with DSLR users and mobile. You cannot be exclusively one or the other. Uh, we're documenting, we're communicating, we're self-evaluating, we're creating images for lectures, for publications, we're doing marketing. If you want to do print media, you still need to go with a DSLR. You need big megapixels, you need the lenses. Let's not kid ourselves. There is no one way here. It's, not, it's, not, it's a two-way street. Um, the unfortunate thing is that the uh, phone manufacturers are pumping new models every year, okay? And as consumers, we're just replacing, we're never really getting familiar with our gear. They're changing specs on us very qu quickly. So we, we need to take everything with a grain of salt. Uh, I think uh, there is innovation. I think uh, um, we cannot force everybody to buy a DSLR, but we can try to make everybody awesome. That's why we're seeing new developments, new eLab cards, new protocols. Uh, we're, we're really working hard so we can be more inclusive across the board. Uh, but everything has to be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, I'm not an early adopter typically. I, I'm a laggard in these kind of technologies. Uh, and uh, the future is going to be shine bright on what we're doing in, in, in dentistry as a whole. But the question is, do you want to use it as a tool, as a communication tool, or do you want to use it as a standardization protocol? So we, we need to, to use it as both. That's, that's how I feel the, the next five years are going to develop. So if we talk about standards, so the, uh, listening to, uh, to your statements, I see that the, the, the main issue of mobile phones is still the, the lens not being standardized. I think the sensor is not the issue if we have enough light. So I know that there are some triggers to, sh to, to use your smartphone with studio flashes but uh, not, not with these ring flashes or, or what we are using on a daily basis for dental photography. So, and the, in, if you imagine then the smartphone behind all this stuff, the, the, the smile light is very smart, but if, if, you, if you then, it, it, re, it reminds me when I started dental photography using my Coolpix camera. For the Coolpix 900, there was an adapter using a lateral flash. And you, Sasha, you remember this. And at the end, this was bulky and a huge thing and absolutely difficult to use. So a DSLR of today is much easier. And imagine the same thing will now be with the smartphones. If you attach all this, then you have like a flogging kit. You know, the, you have the handle, you have the, the microphone, you have the lights, you have everything. At the end, it's a very bulky thing. And imagine going into the mouth with this. So, uh, so there needs to be some development, uh, and and I'm sure that today, and uh, I like I like the idea or the concept to integrate this technology in our workflows, and get get some additional information out of this. But um, I'm I'm not sure if if we if we now can throw away uh, our our DSLR cameras and and switch to smartphones 
uh, this day. I don't know. Maybe, maybe uh, Javier, tell me. No, no, I, I agree. I think it's a, it's a, yeah, for, for some purpose, of course, it can be a good compromise. That's for sure. But it, it all depends on, on how far you want to go with, uh, with the photography and, and the kind of things that you want to, to, to make, right? I mean, we are talking about light. We are talking about how to capture light. And, uh, and the illumination for me is the key, more than the, the device itself. And uh, this, is, this is what I see in professional photography. I mean, it's very difficult to make a difference from, uh, from a cheap uh, DSLR or mirrorless to a, a big expensive camera. If the light of the scene is good, uh, it's perfect, and there is a good photographer behind, you won't, you won't make it any difference between a, a, a huge expensive camera and a cheap one, right? So I think with the phones, it can, it can be a little bit like that. I mean, it's, it's all about how to handle the light. And I agree with you that if you want to have this super high quality illumination, the problem is that the rigs are going to become a little bit strange. Uh, this reminds me a little bit about the video videography with the DSLR, right? So the people mount uh, huge rigs with a lot of stuff around the DSLR. So at the end, it's like you have the small DSLR with the lens there <laughs> and then a huge thing around that is the rig for the video, right? And uh, yeah, what, what is the, of course, it, it is going to save costs, but at the end is a rig that is not for every day. I mean, you, you cannot be using super complicated things, uh, but yeah, I think that there are some compromises that can have good results for for a lot of people, like like this my light, like you know, there are this this is this is giving a uh, enough quality for for most of the people already. So to have a basic documentation every day, and I think that's the purpose. I mean, the purpose of this kind of devices has never been more approachable for everybody to have the the, the some photography, some documentation during their their working time, right? So I think the the target is slightly different. I mean, you can always push it to the limits if you know how to control the light. But the thing is, is, is it worth it really to, to play that much around it in order to get the maximum out of the phone? Or it will be better just to buy a normal DSLR and a, and a known setup that it's working very well and in a simple way you get superb uh, clinical pictures with a DSLR or a mirrorless. That's it. I think there there is a, a point where you jump from from one stage to the other, and and still for me it's it's on the the, the highest standard. Of course, is the is the DSLR or the mirrorless. Yeah. So I think the question there. Add and there the question there. Sorry, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Just want to add something to that. I mean, it is always an interesting debate. You know, you, you know, listening to you guys and, and the debate about flash and the lack of a f lack of flash and, and you know. And that's that's a, that's a technical hurdle. It's a technical problem. We often debate about this. You know, the, the issue that when, when you switch to smart photography, you, you you depend on continuous light because you don't have a flash, right? And then and then, you know, we often talk about standardization, and that's where we come from. We come from you know with biomimetic us guys. We come from standardization. You know, eLab is a protocol for standardizing shape communication, and everything. Right? Um, but. <laughs> You know, as I've learned more about this in the last couple of years and, and I've looked deeper into things from the viewpoint of physics and exchange with, you know, uh, real capacities in this area and stuff, it's, it's an interesting paradox. It really is an interesting paradox because, you know, we're trying to standardize something that has such a multifaceted optical appearance that can't be standardized. So oftentimes I feel that you know, when we when we photograph with a flash, for instance, we are we are recording a momentum, a momentous situation in time, and then and the appearance is true in that moment. It's the same like when you um you know when you pimp your photography with big diffusers and paper, and you get that lollipop photography and stuff. This is not lying. No one's lying. You know, it, it kind of portrays the situation of the teeth in that instant. That flash second of an instant, that's when that is true, but not when the flash doesn't go off. So, you know, the, the appearance of teeth and their color in ambient light conditions, which is very complex because you have light falling off the angles, you know, the walls and stuff onto the teeth, you know, the appearance is quite different 
um, to what teeth look like when you flash them. When you, when you, and, and with a DSLR camera, you must use a flash. You can't do it any other way. You have to use a flash, right? So what I'm trying to say is I'm, I'm, I'm very curious and very excited, actually, to look into those possibilities with the smartphone photography now precisely because it uses continuous light, right? And, and you know, we, we do research. We look at data the whole time. And, and we were looking forward to see, you know, what the data will speak. And so imagine lots of people going to quantify tooth colors with a smartphone or with many smartphones. And, and, you, and you gather a population of tooth colors. Now, how will that relate to the other population of tooth colors that was obtained with DSLR cameras and with a flash? So it's not maybe, you know, the, the camera, whether it's a DSLR camera or, or, or a smartphone, is the recording device, it's the photon counter, basically, right? And then the other thing is the lens, and, and it's the illumination, right? Um, so th these are quite interesting questions. You know, it's, it actually is very difficult to standardize anything when it comes to the quantification of tooth color, no matter if you use spectrometers or radio spectrometers or cameras or smartphones, it actually is quite difficult. No, that's why, that's why I, I came back and I emphasized many times, reminding the article from Wolfgang Bengel back in 1985, that we need standards, not because there is a shade A2, so, so there's, there's something and you take a picture of a patient, the initial situation, then you take a picture one week later, one year later, five years later, 10 years later, and they should look the same. And this for me yeah. is standard. It's not, it's yeah. not that uh, in the picture I select, so that then this, then this leads to this discussion, should I shoot RAW or JPEG? What do I want to do with the pictures? And I'm really happy, Sasha, that you're that you're coming a little bit back from the overdoing things with raw photography and Lightroom and all this stuff. And at the end, we, still need, we will still need raw photography. I mean, for the purpose of what we're doing, shape quantification, you're not going to get past raw photography, but you won't even notice that. You don't even know that. You, you know, when you use it, you don't know it. it you know, it doesn't matter. No, I, ag I agree. So it's like when I buy a new camera, I, I select RAW to, to check the settings and to, to set up the camera that, it's, that the output of my JPEGs looks the same as the camera I used before so that, that I can continue with my documentation over time. So this is what I call standards. This is not a scientific standard or a physical standard uh, talking about uh, whatever parameters of, of light light quality but this is what I call standardized photography and then there are some higher levels some lower levels and 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 the balance is somewhere in between and maybe I would I would give the word to Panos because eliminating eliminating this this uh, impact of light is the 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 polarized or the cross polarized image where we see the true shade so maybe panos get, can give us some insight on uh, on on this topic that is often discussed what what is this all about what do we see when we when when we look at the polarized image so so cross polarization is something that has existed in the science the medical sciences for quite some time coming from dermatology and ophthalmology and uh, they were using it so they can have uh, a more hypochromatic image without any kind of specular reflections. Uh, particularly when you have shiny surfaces, teeth being shiny surfaces, mucosas being shiny, uh, you have a deeper unobstructed view and it's a more of a substrata view. So cross polarization, it does exactly what it says. It, it does eliminate the majority of the specular reflections and it gives you objectivity in your visualization. Now, in order to truly make the image objective, you need to use a common denominator such as the gray reference card that we created with the left system or the new uh, gray reference card that's coming out soon on the market. So you have uh, like a double standard then. So you, you need two common denominators. Now, apparently uh, it has become successful and it has become rather popular because you can see the amount of uh, imitations of these devices on the market. Now. When we're trying to set up standards, meaning that when we develop this product, we, we vowed that we're going to use the same 
polarization sheet across the board, trying to create a standard. What happens when every time when a competitor comes out to market with a new product, what they're doing is they're diluting our standard. They're using a different polarization sheet, which has a different white, uh, color uh, cast. They're going against what we're trying to set as a fundamental. Um, when we had the inception of this daunting task of objective uh, color uh, information and uh, visualization of shade with Javier and, and Sasha a while ago, this wasn't a market a marketing scheme for us. We were trying to deal with a scientific conundrum. That's what's kept us together all these years. It's the scientific curiosity of creating something that's going to be objective. So we, we, we stand steadfast to this task. Uh, we're we're going to continue. The three of us are going to be treading forward, trying to create more uh, objective uh, ways, uh, whether it be with cross uh, polarization or any other image modality. Uh, we're seeking the truth. We're seeking the uh, scientific validation. We're, we're, we're seeking objectivity and we're trying to make this more inclusive for our profession. We're bridging dentistry with dental technology. This has always been the goal. Uh, it just, sometimes the message gets a little bit diluted uh, when you see uh, other approaches which are not scientifically driven, but they're a little bit more marketing driven like and that that makes it makes our task a little bit more difficult getting the message across. I don't know if everybody else agrees, but I think it's going to be an uphill battle until the industry really starts supporting these ideas. We need the help of the dental and the dental technology industry. They have to step up. They have to create objective standards. It's amazing to consider that the car industry, the auto industry has better standards in car paints than the dental industry has with regards to materials. And this is the, the purpose we're trying. We, we're self-funding ourselves. This is all self-funding uh, because we're trying to gain the curiosity of the industry so we can sit on the table as scientists, as material scientists, as clinicians, as technicians, so we can create standards. It's exactly what you're saying. Stand and what Dr. Bengel said, we need standards. We lack standards. And uh, quite frankly, in 2020, it's, it's rather embarrassing. And that's why we're still working hard on this topic. And, uh, and one, of, one of the topic of the special issue on uh, dental photography of the International Journal of Aesthetic Dentistry will also be focused on, on the standards. So I, I tried to keep up the work Wolfgang Bengel started back in the 1980s. Um, and uh, even, even if sometimes I think I'm, uh, I'm the lonely rider try, trying to work on this, and but uh, I, I think it, it, it will be important and no matter what device at the end will be the standard device to take standardized images uh, that's I don't know that so we know in radiology we have the standardized tube we have the, the, the doses we have everything we have the, the films and we have achieved kind of a standard there but in photography, I think we're far away, and uh, I agree with Panos, we're far away of having standards in, in, this, in this field of, uh, of medical technology. So I'm happy that may, maybe in, in shade matching, we are getting closer to a standard with this new ELAP uh, protocol, with this new approach using this, uh, uh, I, I, saw, I saw an image, this very exciting new uh, gray card which has also colors uh, or some sh some what 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 Sasha I you you made me really curious what why why did you add beside being gr a gray card I see something different on the card maybe you can explain a little bit um so yeah so it's quite interesting also somewhat amusing we often have a giggle about this um uh, we we might as well call this a black card because it doesn't have to be gray anymore um. But you still call it a gray card because everybody knows what a gray card is, right? So everybody makes this mental connection. Gray card means photography, right? That's kind of established. So we kept it gray, not because it has to be gray, to be honest, right? Um, and the reason it doesn't have to be gray anymore is, is, is precisely because of this, of this um, 
pattern that's that's on the uh, Prey Reference card there. So, I mean, everybody obviously knows the x rod color checker, which has been a standard in the industry for, for, for a very long, very long time. And it's used in all sorts of diverse applications and stuff. And so we use advanced computer modeling and also a huge, huge, huge database, which we have obtained uh, from, from the Eli Prime software and all its, you know, thousands of users worldwide and stuff. And so the data that's been collected and we've created, um, think of it as, an, as, as a dental tooth color X-ray checker. That's what it basically is, right? And, and with this, you gain a lot more accuracy because imagine this, okay? So this is, again, you know, as Panos just said it a minute ago, you know, sometimes we think we, we're a little bit nuts as to what we're trying to do here, okay? So imagine someone's going to take a photo with, you know, a Samsung smartphone, which are great, or, my God, the new iPhone 12 Pro is like, you know, somebody was just saying, uh, what about older reflex cameras like a D50? I would say that the image quality out of the, the iPhone 12 Pro is, is better than that of a D50, no doubt. You know what I mean? I mean, it's amazing how, you know, even in low light conditions and so forth, right? But imagine that somebody wants to take a photo of someone's teeth with a smartphone. And, and, and then you want to photograph the same situation, you know, with uh, a, a Nikon 8500, D850 or something like that, like a totally different piece of technology, right? But still, still, the same object needs to measure in the same way. Right, we're talking about standards, okay? So it needs to be a standardized way. So how do you do that? How do you how do you equalize the playing field? How do you how do you lift the accuracy of a little smartphone camera that could fit on a stand, uh, so it matches up to, you know, a really big sensor? How do you do that, right? And well, you do it you do it with that. You need you need a specific color space um, definition there, and 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 this way you can boost accuracy, you can boost precision, and the other thing also is. Um, they, they keep they're bringing out new cameras all the time. Now they're more focusing on mirrorless cameras, but you have new cameras coming out all the time from Canon, from Nikon, from Sony, and so forth, right? And new players appear. Um, you know, with the previous process, you had to physically have that camera. If there was a new camera, you had to physically have it, and you needed to profile that in order to create a profile. Now you don't. You no longer need that. The you know every single image that you take with a smartphone or with your big fancy DSLR camera will write an individual DCP profile every single time. This is the highest level of accuracy. It can't be any more accurate than that. This is the highest level. And, and so the, the big challenge has been, you know, to produce this card, to get this accuracy produced, is, is, is been the, the most difficult objective in this, in this exercise, which turned out to be, you know, surprisingly difficult. But that's why, that's why it has that pattern on there. Another thing that it has um, that, that is, you know, quite cool is it's got those, um, those dots here. And, and these are hexagons. And this is a metabolism indicator. It's a light indicator is what it is, okay? So standardization, exactly as Panos had said it, standardization. We need to agree on a common illuminant. And the illuminant that we've agreed on is the D50, which is the internal illuminant, okay? And that's easy to reproduce with modern lighting, okay? So everything needs to be in line. So the entire computational um, method behind it is based on D50. And so you need to view it in something D50. And this thing tells you that. So when the two, when the hexagon has the same color, then you're looking at an approximate D50 uh, il illuminant, and that's that's the way you should be viewing it, right? And when and when the when the hexagons within itself have two separate colors, that's an indicator that you're looking at the long uh, wrong, under the wrong light condition. Like very often, in in, in uh, a lot of modern uh, dental surgeries, mostly in, in Anglo-American countries, I have to say. Um, you know, they pay interior architects to create these fuzzy lightings and, you know, they, they look like a spa, like a dental spa with little pin lights and LEDs and stuff, right? That might serve other purposes, but for the purpose of shade quantification, it's not very good, okay? So this will give you an indication, you know, to tell you, hey, maybe the light conditions in your surgery are not ideal. Maybe that's not how you should be looking at the result of the restoration. That's not how you should be doing it, you know? So we, we really have put a lot of thought into this. And another thing that it also has, people have asked, it still has the millimeter scale that Panos came up with um, while he was still studying orthodontics. So that's still on there. We, we love it dearly and we didn't, we, didn't, um, we didn't leave that out. And it also has this contrast field here. Um, and it's remarkably difficult to get something really white and fairly black. It's pretty difficult to get that, but we managed to do this with this contrast field here. And what you can do with that is, you can use it for optical quantification of materials. So materials have more than just color. These are diffusely scattering objects, right? 
So color per se is just absorption. It's just one of those elements, right? It's one, one, one of those parameters, but it has other parameters as well, like the translucency parameter. In other words, a measure of opacity or opalescence. With this, it could be, it, it can be quantified. It can be auto quantified with this feature. So, and it, it, it also has a UV resistant surface limited on it because we've, you know, we've learned a lot. We have a lot of experience in this area. Um, so it, it can, it can easily handle the rugged conditions that we often have in dental surgeries, especially when it comes to detergents that are used for cleaning. So it's, it's, it, it, it addresses, this, uh, addresses this issue as well. And another thing, standardization. Standardization, when we look at other industries, like Panas mentioned the car industry, the automotive industry, right? How they tackle standardization, I totally agree with them. It's embarrassing what we do. And, and, this, and this is a high quality, high tech reference standard. It's not meant to last for 20 or 30 years. It's not, it has a shelf life, right? And, and, and its quality is being persistently monitored. So when it degrades to what reason ever, the software, will, the software is going to let you know that, uh, the, you know that the gray card is maybe degrading and you might have to replace it because it's exactly the philosophy that Panos outlined. It's about one level ground standard from A to Z, one standard is, is, is what's needed. So we can speak the same language and when we can do that, we have really changed something practically because we can improve things. We can find errors, we can analyze errors, we can improve. We can become a better person, a better self than previously. That's what we can do with this. That's what standards are for. That's why we need them badly. And not just for color measurement, we need it for materials as well. Materials is a disaster in dentistry. It's a disaster. You, I, I remember that you, you published a study, Alessandro, in the Journal of Aesthetic and Restorative Dentistry, where you looked at um, composites and you looked at composite blocks and stuff, right? And you found, you found the same as we have in dental ceramics, maybe even a little worse, because there's much more variation from one batch to another. I'm sorry, but this is not acceptable. This is, this is unacceptable. It's not, it's, it's not acceptable. This needs to be fixed. And like Pana says, we're, we're self-funded. We do this because we want to change something. We want to, we want to rid ourselves of an industry persistent problem and not because we're being paid by the industry, because we're doing it because there's a need for it. It was born out of the need and practicality. That's why we do what we do. Do you agree? To totally. And it's, it's amazing that uh, the audience is like paralyzed. Uh, Sasha, you're talking about uh, this, the color part of photography, which is very important, but I think a lot of people don't even take care about that. So, um, but I think it's important that we really push also on this. And uh, but to sum to sum things up, so today we are in a transition phase. So we try to keep the standards, and I think this is important. So the, my goal would be that we get a photography standard as we have it for radiology. So radiology looks inside our patients and photography looks from outside to our patients. So these are the two tools we have to visualize or analyze in three dimension, internally and externally our patients. And so I'm, I'm really desperately looking to have also a standard how we look from outside to our patients. And uh, 3D technology is evolving. So when, uh, when I'm doing my photo, sta photo status, I combine 3D scanning in for the intraoral images with the extraoral photography. So I think extra, so intraoral photography will become less important in the future. So I don't know what what is uh, what, what are your <laughs> maybe, maybe Panos, Panos is laughing. So Panos, what are what are your thoughts on this? Uh, well. Let's just examine uh, the, the, the most popular iOS uh, intraoral scanning devices on the market that offer a color rendition, okay? Uh, there's no standardization between it, whether you're using 3Shape or you're using iTero or Medit or you're going to use uh, another company. So we're still lacking standards um, critically and uh, we can help in this <laughs> approach us. We're trying to level the, the playing field for everybody to have the same standard. And uh, it's so important what you're, you're, you're touching upon digital. And of course, you know, we transition from film. I don't think and many people are using film anymore, slide film or conventional film. Primarily 99.9% .9 is using digital imaging. 
And uh, we're getting more into, as you mentioned, intraoral scanning, uh, extraoral scanning. Right now it's becoming a hot topic. Uh, CBCT radiation doses are going down, so we're incorporating a little bit more frequently in our diagnosis and treatment planning. And everything's about superimposition. Uh, so if you factor all these imaging modalities, because we're talking about cameras, but I think we should expand our universe a little bit with regards to imaging, uh, we still need standards that are going to merge all this data together. And I'm not talking about just a superimposition, but you know, the, 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 and, and I think Javier is, is uh, very keen uh, because through some of our discussions, uh, he's been talking about uh, new technologies like photogrammetry and how it's going to come into uh, what we're doing, uh, scanning technologies, how to project uh, images upon 3D models. I think Javi really, has the tacit knowledge to tell us what the future beholds with regards to imaging. So maybe I want to finish off with uh, giving Javi the, uh, the podium uh, so he can illuminate us as he does very frequently uh, over the past uh, number of years. Well, uh, really, I think it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a truth, but uh, I just always try to, to give a uh, you know my point of view and, and help and that's uh that's what i try always uh but regarding the topic that you said that is a it's a very interesting topic because i think that how technology is evolving and uh the the experience that i had with the computer graphics and uh, and how i see the output from the internal scanners uh, definitely things are changing because with the increase of resolution of the scanners and the increase of the accuracy of the color output too, I, I think uh, in the future, I, I'm pretty sure that a lot of people will not really use it, an intraoral camera or a DSLR to take intraoral pictures anymore. Because when you scan, you will get already the information there and you will not need actually just for maybe the more aesthetic artistic part of it maybe you will like to to use the, the camera uh, but uh, for the recording of the information itself i think it's it's not going to be needed anymore because the, the quality of the of the of the scanning and uh, and the colors are getting better and better so i had some experience with this ply uh, output and i must say that the it's, it's vertex color, of course, is limited. It's never going to be as high resolution as, as we are using today with, with computer graphics, with UV maps and everything. Uh, so the texture information is not as big as we can have with a camera. But I think the technology is there. I mean, it's a matter of time uh, that this, this keeps evolving, right? And give it, giving more and more resolution and more. And since the computers are getting more and more powerful, this is becoming more possible because basically with the scanning, uh, it's like with photogrammetry. I mean, you can make. Uh, there were some studio rigs, you know, in the in the in the Hollywood studios in California and several places where they have like a sphere, you know, where they take a lot of pictures and they do photogrammetry and they can capture the face to 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 the skin pores, right? So you have even the skin pores information there, but you can imagine they are capturing with maybe. Uh, a hundred of DSLRs, uh, every DSLR with 40 megapixels or something like that. And that takes literally like two hours or three hours to process in huge computers, right? So of course we cannot have that kind of power real time when we are scanning, right? It's impossible. Even if we know that most of the scanners, they don't show us the, the final output because they need a post-processing of the images, right? They take, but getting to that kind of level of detail it's, it's actually impossible because we cannot wait for one or two hours for our computer to process that information, right? But it doesn't mean that it's not possible. I mean, it, the technology is there. It's just a matter of when you increase the processing power, then this is going to change everything. And I think that the technology regarding connections is going to change everything because when, when you think about high-speed internet connection, about the, the 5G, and all these things, uh, it, this is going to speed up the process. Why? Because you are not going to process anymore in your computer. In the future, your computer is going to be a screen. It's going to be a controller, but it's not going to be the computer itself. The computer will be located somewhere in a data center, and it's a huge beast that can process a lot of information when you need to. 
And that's that's the future. And that's going to be the game changer because when you can just stream your video on 4K taken with a scanner, right? Or even higher resolution cameras, you know, on the scanner. And this can be processed immediately uh, elsewhere in a big computer and then get back to you. You will be talking about, again, five minutes processing and it will be the same experience as we have today, but the quality will be much, much higher. But of course, that, that means we have we will have a system that is not standalone. I mean, it needs connection, high-speed connection and so on. So you really need to have a minimum. But technology is there. So I expect that maybe in, in, in 10 years time, it will be a huge difference how we are looking at the models. Also because visualization of the meshes, of the high quality meshes is gonna change. I mean, I, I you know, I'm, because I'm computer graphic, uh, involved i know about all these game engines and so on if you hear about the game engines and <laughs> and real engine 5 for example which will handle millions and mi hundreds of millions of polygons i mean that means that you can visualize any kind of mesh in your computer instantly with a super high quality this is going to be a game changer absolutely a game changer for visualizing the clinical thing so <laughs> So Javier, just just let me let me show a short video, which is a little bit advertising for our photography community. But in this room, we have the ability to teach people dental photography. We are focusing on details like the operation of a particular camera or other topics related to photography. We can render objects, to interact in real time. We can also share videos and presentations. The room is designed for one-on-one -on -one workshop sessions, but can also be used for group session or small meetings. Check out our website for more information, and to book your individual coaching. So this this is this is a small small thing. We have discussed about this. This is uh, this is uh, with done with Mozilla Hubs running on Amazon Web Services. So this is part of what you were mentioning. And uh, the next step, we are working with Unreal Engine. So Panos, Panos, you know the Mandalorian. So um, so green green screen technology will be replaced with with LED walls. And um, and I can tell you, we are working on this. Uh, and I'm working also on a virtual studio and I will invite you to be my guest in my virtual studio very soon. So I think this is an addition to, uh, to uh, where, where Sasha is already on the Death Star. So, and uh, I, will, I will beam beam us up to Sasha and, uh, and then we will go and visit, visit ourselves or meet, meet in, in a different world. And uh, with these words, I really want to thank you for, for taking the time, for giving us uh, this, uh, this insight. And I always love Sasha being so enthusiastic. So I can listen to you for hours because when you start speaking, it's really amazing for somebody interested in technology. And I feel, I feel your passion. I feel the passion of Panos, of Javier for this topic. And, and we need these guys. We need people like you to bring technology further to at the end also make make understandings make it more basic at the end so what we need is simple protocols uh, easy things like javier is working hard on simplifying composite shade matching sasha you're working on ceramic shade matching panos is working on everything uh, <laughs> and and we are trying to and I've, I'm trying to bring you together and I'm really looking forward. I'm really looking forward to have you all in this next special issue of the International Journal of Aesthetic Dentistry. So let's make some advertisement also for this. We have a Facebook group. We are on Instagram. Uh, I have also my dentist camera Instagram account where, where, we, where we all share our information. Panos, you should be a little bit more active also on Instagram because Facebook is a little bit sleeping. Although the International Journal of Aesthetic Dentistry now has 10,000 followers, but they are sleeping. And uh, I, see more movement on, <laughs> I see more movement on Instagram. And it's really important that we continue this discussion and maybe we will meet in one, two, three months again. 
uh, as a preparation also for our upcoming uh, special issue on uh, on dental photography and maybe the issue is dental photography and more so we already highlighted that in our special issue back in 2019 i was talking about the the combination of photography and intraoral scanning of shade matching of all this technology bringing bringing putting all the pieces together to get something that is at the end also user friendly so i think a lot of people are a little bit confused about too much technology going around and uh, our goal should be to simplify things and to make technology accessible to as much people as possible so i i uh, and this uh, this is my these are my last words and uh, panos you what uh, may, maybe one sentence one sentence from each of you to finish to finish this up stay safe stay sane stay home happy holidays uh 2020 has been a very challenging year but uh i hope everybody keeps the faith uh, having faith in in each other having faith in our creator having faith in what we do uh, will get us through and we're going to come out shining in 2021, hopefully. I just wish uh, health and happiness and a happy new year to everybody. Thank you so much for hosting us. It's been an honor. Sasha? Right, so again, thank you so much you know, for hosting us and I can only agree to what uh, Yimpano says. It's been a challenging year, but you know, every crisis also has opportunities and we have used the time as best as we could um, to come up with new innovations and to realize exactly what you, Alessandra, were just talking about to, you know, develop awesome technology and make it accessible and make it easy to use. That's exactly the focus of our attention. And, you know, we, we, we're going to see a lot of really amazing uh, innovations th uh, that will be launched next year, in the beginning of next year, um, that we have developed between uh, the three of us, extending our activities and, you know, helping the, helping the community to become better at, at communicating and growing, you know, growing together and making uh, sufficient and, and rational use of modern technology with the help of science and above all standardization. So uh, thanks very much for the invitation and for giving us yet again the opportunity to talk to you about this is always enlightening. Thank you. Javier. Thank you, Alessandro, for the, for the opportunity. It was a pleasure as always. And uh, yeah, I think they, they already said everything. I think I, I completely agree. This was a, a tough year, I think, for everybody. And uh, we really look forward for next year and uh, things changing back uh, slowly back to normal and um, and hope everybody stay safe and, and hope to see you all next year uh, as soon as possible. And yeah, it's... Uh, it's tough times, but as I said, uh, as, as Sasha said, actually, uh, yeah, it's always bringing new opportunities and new ideas and new things, and, and that's the, the positive side of it. So uh, we need to, to keep the positive view. So, and this is one of the positive things that, that it brings, all these opportunities online. So thank you, Alessandro, and thank so you, thank everybody. You. Thank, thank you, everybody, for, for being my guest. And uh, the discussion goes on on YouTube and Facebook. So if there are any questions, I will feel free to forward them to you. And uh, I'm sure we will meet again online. And I hope also that we will meet very soon physically again. Um, we will see. We will see. Stay safe, stay healthy. Wishing everybody a wonderful Christmas time in the families and stay, stay safe and healthy. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Thank you.